help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Hey, welcome back, everybody, to our study of the Ladder of Divine Ascent by St. John Climacus. And uh, it's good to be back with you all, and sorry for the hiatus, uh, but things are moving along now. As most of you have probably heard, I'm in a little time of transition here to the Archeparchy of Pittsburgh, and uh, things are moving along well, and uh, I've already started concelebrating and uh, getting my feet wet, uh, but uh, we've had to set up some new things uh, in regards to Philokalia Ministries. For all of those who have been donating in the past, uh, if you want to continue to support Philokalia Ministries, we're setting up a new uh, bank account for it and a new website, and uh, and so it'll just be about a week, and we'll send out uh, an email to let everybody how, know how to do that. But if you're currently giving simply to the Orator, if you want to continue to give it to them, that's fine. Uh, but if you want to support Philokalia Ministries, uh, just wait about a week or so, and we'll send out a, an email. Okay? And uh, the link should be the same every week going forward. So once you have it, you should be in good shape here moving forward. We won't change them. And feel free to share it with a friend that you think would want to join the group as well. Okay? So just a, a reminder, if you could type out your response uh, or question, and uh, then when I call on you, if you put your hand up, then uh, I'll read it and we'll, we'll uh, move along with your question. And if you feel more comfortable asking out loud, that's fine too. I'm not going to be hard, harsh about it, uh, but it does help with the flow of the group. And so we found that it's worked pretty well for us. Okay. So again, we are on page 62 of the text. If you remember, uh, we've been looking at the first three steps as a unit, uh, all have to do with a break uh, from the world that Climacus speaks about, especially for those who, of course, are entering into the desert, who are seeking to embrace this particular form of life with its great solitude, discipline, obedience to a superior or an elder. Uh, and so for the monk, especially, uh, the pull is always going to be back to the world where they've given themselves over. Uh, this was before vows for, for uh, most of them. Most of them were seeking simply to give themselves over to God completely, to embrace the gospel as deeply as they could, as well as a deep life of deep prayer and silence. Uh, but the pull would always be back to the world. And uh, especially for those uh, immersed in deep solitude, the, the temptation is always going to be to step out of that, especially when it becomes difficult or there's no consolation in it, or when they ex begin to experience something of the poverty of spirit that is involved with it, not only the physical poverty, certainly, that they embraced, uh, but uh, sort of the loneliness, the isolation that can go along with the, the solitude in the desert. And so these first three have to do with uh, the initial break with the world, renunciation, a detachment, which we are concluding this evening, and then finally exile, or uh, as you'll see in the footnote on the next page, sometimes it's un called unworldliness or journey. And so there are multiple meanings to, to the word, uh, but it's uh, having sort of no place to lay your head kind of attitude that you are exiled from the world and the things of the world and have, as it were, no place to call your home because your home has become the kingdom so, so deeply and so fully. And for all of us as Christians, I, I think this should be the sense that we have. We are citizens of the kingdom and there should be a longing within our hearts uh, to know the fullness of what has been already given to us in Christ and promised to us. Uh, tomorrow we celebrate the feast of the Ascension and it's in a really powerful way. It's our feast day uh, because we see uh, our humanity being raised up with, with Christ into the kingdom to become part of God, God himself. And, uh, and this is our destiny, deification, uh, experience of this deep intimate intimacy within the life of the Holy Trinity. And this is where the longing of our heart should be guiding us. And so as we read these first three steps, we want to keep this in mind that what is driving it is a desire for God and the richness of his love. And so it's not a hatred for the world. It's not a hatred for family 
or friends is uh, not despising material goods, but it's preferring God to all things. And for the monk in particular, as I said, who's set aside all things, the temptation is going to be uh, to go back to them, to find, seek consolation in them. And it's in their experience, I think, that we, we gain an insight into the struggle that we have on a day-to-day -day basis, the things that can subtly uh, pull us away from God, distract us, even the good things in our life. And so some of the things that John says will be surprising, a little bit jarring for us. That's okay. I don't think we have to worry about sort of pulling it apart and really seeking to read it in a discerning fashion. Uh, but nonetheless, I think all the things that he talks about, we can you know, pull us uh, away uh, from God in a subtle way. And so it's not only the bad things or the things that are overtly sinful, but it can even be the good things of this world that become the focal point of our attention. Okay. So we're again, we're picking up with number nine on page 62. No one will enter the heavenly bride chamber wearing a crown unless he makes the first, second, and third renunciation. I mean the renunciation of all concerns and people and parents, the cutting out of one's will, and the third renunciation, the conceit that dogs obedience. Come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the impurity of the world. For who amongst them has ever worked any miracles? Who has raised the dead? Who has driven out devils? No one. All these are the victorious rewards of monks, rewards which the world cannot receive. And if it could, then what is the need of asceticism or solitude? So, a challenging paragraph to begin with. Uh, but he links all three of these together for us again and puts the things of this world, including those things that are good, uh, as pulling us away from the particular life of following Christ, of obedience, radical obedience to the call of love. And uh, we've talked many times before that unlike some of the prophets calling their disciples in the past, We've often used the example of Elijah and Elisha, that prophets, even though they are called by God, spoke for God, did not have this capacity to make absolute demands upon their disciples. Whereas we see in the gospel, Christ again and again, uh, calling people, saying, follow me. And they drop everything at that moment, and they follow him, uh, almost inexplicably. You know, we, we have no sense of what it is that makes uh, Peter and Andrew, James and John, drop their nets and their boat, and James and John to leave their father behind. But it's the experience of Christ, uh, the, the Lord of life, uh, the governor of the world standing before them, the Lord of love, uh, that draws their hearts like no other thing possibly could. And so it's this encounter with Christ the, 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 the pull of love itself, love himself, that allows this kind of radical freedom to let go of everything in order to pursue him and the life that he offers. And this is the same motivation for the monk, uh, but it should also be the same motivation for all of us as Christian men and women, simply to embrace asceticism uh, without this desire without this longing within the heart, is foolhardy. Uh, you know, we're, we are letting go of so many different things within the world, separating ourselves, as John says, from the world, that is the fallen aspects of it, all the things that would lead us away from God. And unless we are driven by uh, the love of God and have hope in the promises of Christ, we are the most pitiable of individuals. And uh, so we want to have this kind of clarity as we read through it. He also already mentions here the final, or the final of these three, exile. And he says of the conceit that dogs obedience, that uh, our, the pull of the world is always going to lead us to want to let go of our obedience to Christ or our obedience to our particular commitments. And it's our exile from the wor world of the pull of the things of the world over 
uh, over, it's our exile from those things in favor of, of what God has led us to embrace, in favor of the path that he's led us upon that leads to him and leads to our salvation. And it's uh, our unwillingness to see ourselves as journeying toward Christ, as exiles in this world, that often will pull us away uh, from, from that path that God has called us upon. And so again, I think we want to pull the things that he's talking about specifically for monks and, and see how it applies to our, our day-to-day life. And it can be very subtle. And as we, as we go through the steps here, we'll see the pull is often from the most, comes to us most from the things that are good, the things that have value, the things that we love, but can be used by the evil one to tempt us. Uh, and in some way to exalt it above whatever whatever God has called us to embrace. Okay. Number 10. After our renunciation, when the demons inflame our hearts by reminding us of our parents and brethren, then let us arm ourselves against them with prayer, and let us inflame ourselves with the remembrance of the eternal fire, so that by reminding ourselves of this, we may quench the untimely fire of our heart. So it's interesting, he's telling us, to, as it were, to fight fire with fire. You know, the fire of our worldly passions or our bodily passions, our desire for the things of this world, to fight that with the fire of our desire for God, but also our acknowledgement of the eternal fires, uh, which come through turning away from God. And so the remembrance of death, the remembrance of judgment are things that pull us, pull things into perspective for us in the spiritual battle. So when we find ourselves uh, being tempted in a fierce way by the demons, uh, memento mori, remember you shall die, uh, remember death, that uh, this can pull things into perspective for us, us very quickly. Life is over in a blink of an eye. And we can become so absorbed and our desires can become so inflamed that we lose sight of that, of that reality. 11. If anyone thinks he is without attachment to some object, but is grieved at its loss, then he is completely deceiving himself. And so sometimes we only see the level of our attachment when we, we lose certain things in our life and, and when we see ourselves mourn over them and the nature of our mourning. You know, certainly there are losses in our life that uh, call for tears, you know, especially when it, it involves those that we love or uh, things that, again, are good. But I think when we experience loss or failure, uh, we lose a job, or a project fails, a path doesn't open up for us, uh, we can become very disheartened and desolate. And this uh, indicates for us a kind of attachment to, to the things of this world. If our meaning and identity is found in Christ, so if we see ourselves through the Paschal mystery, the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ, and what we have become in him. And again, this is where I think tomorrow's feast day is so important for us, because we see that promise held out to us in this beautiful way in the ascension, that if we're looking at our life through that lens, then even the greatest of losses for us is going to be seen through the eyes of faith, or th through our hope that we're able to hold fast to the promises of Christ. And so even while mourning very real losses we, and weeping over them, we weep and we mourn as men and women of faith. And this is especially true, I think, at the death of loved ones. Uh, you know, that we see in the gospel that tears are called for. We, if you remember the death of Lazarus in particular, uh, Christ weeps at the tomb. In fact, the, the people sort of make note of it in, in the gospel. But uh, I think that little two-word sentence in the gospel, Jesus wept, is one of the most important 
uh, for us, you know, because it shows that in this world, we, we will know sorrow, we will experience loss, and that love uh, demands at times tears. And uh, the fact that Christ weeps over the loss of Lazarus uh, shows us that. But we, again, we, we weep and we shed tears as men and women of faith. Uh, that in such a way that we see the empty tomb, that death has no hold over us or a hold over those that we love. And so whatever we lose within this life, and especially the, the loss of those we love the most, uh, we, we mourn that as men and women of faith. And uh, again, the Desert Fathers, I think, show us this in the starkest way because they have died to the world, literally. And they've set aside everything uh, and to keep their eyes upon he who is life. And without it, they would not be able to persevere within it. And without this kind of faith, we won't persevere very long in living out the gospel in our lives. Okay. Any comments or questions? before I move on to the next paragraph. Sam. I'm reminded here of a quote by then Cardinal Watiwa. Freedom is the means, love is the end. Our culture often confuses our understanding of freedom by defining it as freedom to do this or that, as opposed to freedom from sin and our appetites, et cetera. And that we lose sight of the fact that our freedom is brought to perfection in love. And that is its very purpose. The saints in heaven still retain their freedom. They have freely chosen love for all eternity. And therein lies the relationship between this detachment, this freedom of heart, and our call to love. It seems to me that one could think of freedom as the medium through which love travels just as a wave may travel through a medium. If we seek to grow in love, it seems that what's needed is more to clear the way for love to move within us and through us precisely by seeking this freedom of art. Wow, that's beautiful. Could you copy that out of a book? That's extraordinary. <laughs> that's beautiful. Uh, absolutely. And I think to couch it in the way that you did, especially in light of uh, uh, Pope John Paul II's writings uh, prior to his uh, becoming Pope, uh, love is the end and freedom is the meaning and it is freedom from sin. And uh, we often see things the opposite way around, that freedom is license to do what we want uh, until we begin to experience the poverty of that, that it does not lead, lead either to freedom or to love at all. In fact, over the course of our life, we begin to see the greater and greater poverty that brings, it brings to us. And so there are often those who have very little perhaps within this world, and yet have their focus very clear, clearly set on the things that value, are of great value, uh, to the, the love of God, but the love of others in Christ and the depth of the intimacy, the joy that that brings to them. So often, you know, the simple, ordinary family life is one of the deepest joys in this world. And when a family is focused upon Christ as a whole, then that intimacy grows deeper and deeper. And the intimacy between the husband and wife grows more and more uh, deep over the course of time as well. And uh, and so I think this is where, you know, and you put it so beautifully here in your comment, that if we are able to sort of look at what John is saying here about detachment and to see it in these terms that I think we can wrap our minds around and also see our own life in light of it, then it becomes much easier to embrace. Because I think oftentimes looking at the fathers just on the surface, it seems like a rejection or a hatred of the things of this world. And John will try to draw us back over and over again and say, no, that's not the case. Uh, but the language that is used, especially since he's talking to monks, often makes that difficult. So thank you for your comment, right, right on the money. 
Very good. Thanks. Any others? Any follow up? Okay. Number 12, if young people are prone to the desires of physical love and to luxurious ways, wish to enter the monastic life, let them exercise themselves in all sobriety and prayer and persuade themselves to abstain from all luxury and guile, lest their last state be worse than the first. This harbor provides safety, but also exposes one to danger. Those who sail to the spiritual seas know this, sail the spiritual seas, that is, know this, for it is a pitiful sight to behold those who have survived perils at sea, suffering shipwreck in harbor. This is the second step. Let those who run the race imitate not Lot's wife, but Lot himself and flee. So a great thing, you know, there are those who are in the world who can desire the monastic life and the commitment of it. And they can even see the beauty of it. And yet not really having abstained from the luxuries of this life or ordered their desires toward God can make that movement out of impulse or the simple attraction to the, the, the monastic life. But once they find themselves within it and begin to have to do the battle that is particular to it, then they find themselves uh, smashing against the rocks. But to enter into the desert for the monks was to do battle. This was the battleground with the demons and where what lies within the mind and the heart is revealed the most because of the silence and the lack of diversion. And so simply to move on impulse into this life without really having engaged in the ascetical life, as he says here in the life of prayer, uh, abstaining from luxury, guile, uh, sobri and sobriety, uh, without having done these things for a long time and put one's desire to the test, then they can leave the world where they may have been doing well, even in the spiritual life, and then smash against the rocks if that once they enter into the battle of the monastic life and become discouraged and disheartened altogether. And so you know, th this life certainly is not for all, and in fact, very few, uh, not as few as we imagine, though. I think even, I've mentioned this a couple times, that in, in the deserts of Egypt, just in the Wadi Natrun area, there are thousands of monks who are living this life, and the, 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 the monasteries are huge in, in, this, in the sense of the spread of the territory. And this doesn't include all those who have moved out into greater solitude. And many of those are educated, you know, were professionals within the world, and yet felt that call from God. And, and so made the choice to uh, enter into these desert monasteries. So it's very, what we're reading about is alive and well and flourishing, and flourishing in a country where Christians are persecuted as well. And maybe that's why it's flourishing, because often the Christians in those countries, you know, have to learn to live with a kind of detachment. And because they often are deprived of positions within society and, uh, and certain rights as well. Anthony. Okay. If this life is not for all, but for a comparative few, why is the monastic life, why is the monastic life presented as if you want to obey Christ, completely attach and be a monastic? Well, I think so often because they are writing for, for monks. And in particular, John Climbus uh, was writing for the monks of a neighboring abbey at the request of the abbot. And so he's already writing to those who have made the choice and have had entered into the life. And so his writing is very specific in that way. But what is the enduring value of the, of the uh, desert spirituality is what it reveals about the human mind and heart, the struggle with the passions, ordering the desires toward God, the call to pray without ceasing. You know, all the things that we will be discussing in the coming steps, the virtues to be fostered, the, the vices to be fought with, how it is that we are to learn to pray on a day-to-day -day basis. All of this arises out of this 
very clear view of the mind and heart that arose from this deep ascetical life. You know, as we've talked about many times before, that Christianity is an ascetical religion. We are called to exercise our faith, and part of that is our struggle to embrace the grace that God has given to us and that we receive through the sacramental life in order that it might bear fruit, that we might lead a God-pleasing life, that the gospel really might come alive within us, that we might be living icons, if you will, of the gospel. And so the battle that we fight is no different than the battle that the monks fight. They, they fight it in a particular place and on a particular path of the desert and of this deep solitude. But each of us are called to live it within our own state. So married couples you know, are called to embrace the ascetical life that is in accord with their station in life. And they're still called, if they're to be committed to each other and to love each other completely and to love their, their children and, and raise them to love God, then that means that they are going to have to struggle with the passions as anybody, as anyone else. And, you know, whether it's anger or avarice or, uh, or, or lust, you know, all these things are, you know, the battle remains for us, whether we're in the world or in the desert. And I think the, the value of the insights of the fathers is that they had stripped themselves so much of the things that are distractions that they could see this struggle in all of its subtleties, the subtle movements of the mind and the heart, but also the demons to pull us away from God. And it's our job, certainly, I think, and that's why we would have a group like this, because I think just picking up the ladder of divine ascent or the philokalia or uh, St. Isaac's, the Syrian's ascetical homilies, it would be very difficult for us to go through that cold and without unpacking it and understanding something of the anthropology, the psychology uh, of the fathers, as well as their understanding of the action of the demons, but also the action of God's grace. You know, all of these things become the lens if, through which we view our lives as well. But it, it is for us to apply it. And uh, they're very clear about that. That this, the, if you read the introduction to the Philoclea, for, for, for example, St. Nicodemus says, this is not written simply for those in black robes. You know, that it is written for all those who are pursuing to live the gospel in its fullness. And uh, St. John Christum says the same thing about unceasing prayer. You know, it's not simply for the monk to cultivate that in his life, that we are to strive throughout the course of our life to become prayer, to, so, to have our focus so much upon God and to be seeking him and turning to him so often that in, in all that we do, uh, this movement toward God has so formed the heart that all, all things lead us to him. And this is really what we would want to go, our goal to be. So a husband or a wife, mother, father, who are deeply immersed in the sacramental life, who throughout their day call out to God in this simple prayer that the fathers put before us, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, or have mercy on me, a sinner. Uh, that takes this, and uh, the author of the Cod of Unknowing says it, an atom of a moment to turn the mind and the heart to God, and then to step back into one's work. And so the day becomes this ebb and flow between what God has given us and placed in our care and to turning to him to seek the grace in order to carry out his will. And this should be the movement for us. Uh, in terms of the sacramental life, we've often talked about our lives as moving from Eucharist to Eucharist that we enter into that deep intimacy with him in order to step back in to living out the gospel in our life. Uh, the problem is, I think, in our, our life has become so fragmented. And uh, I think our, especially then our relationship with God and the spiritual life has become one of those fragments and one that is of equal size to everything else in our life. And the busier and the more frenetic our life becomes, the more God is pushed out to the margins. And so I think what the Desert Fathers set before us 
is not the monastic life, not leaving the world as it is this radical turning toward God and giving our, our life over to him so that he is the, the, the beginning and end of all that we do. Did you have any follow-up? Oh, I see somebody sent. You have a follow-up to that, Anthony? Okay, Josie had a question she accidentally hit the enter key for. Is it possible that the solitude can lead to a kind of self-centeredness, perhaps in some kind of people? I understand that the focus on love is the thing that keeps a person safe from the danger. But what is love in the spiritual sense with very little concrete manifestations like others to serve or even to forgive? Is love in this case a focus on God contemplation? Yes, you know, I think, you know, the solitude and, and the silence of the monastic life could easily lead to self-absorption. Uh, that one could lose sight of God. There's a, a monk who's living as a hermit uh, near St. Anthony's Monastery, uh, Father Lazarus. And he says, you know, I have to have this role written so deeply on my heart, or I, I could sleep all day. Nobody would know the difference. I could go in my cave and I could lay down and I could sleep all day. But certainly that wouldn't bring me to the end uh, of, of the life that I've embraced. So for him, he has to internalize this role of life and this desire for God so deeply so that in that solitude, he does not become focused upon simply himself. And we know that uh, uh, solitude can be a kind of defense mechanism, a way of avoiding the things in our life that are difficult to bear with or to deal with, whether it's people or circumstances. And it's not necessarily turning toward God. And so most definitely, to answer the first part of your question, it's very easy for that to happen. And the fathers warn against this often, uh, that uh, simply to enter into that solitude, uh, uh, without the desire for God, is to open ourselves up to a whole host of spirits and not, not the Holy Spirit. And this, the self-absorption can become so great that we begin to live not a godly life, but a demonic life, because we become tossed around by the, the temptations that are put before us, cut off from the life of grace. And so in regards to loving others, you know, that's a good question, because uh, I think in the, in the West in particular, uh, but for many people as a whole, I think we have a tendency to individualize our faith life and our understanding of our life in Christ. Uh, whereas our the feast tomorrow that we're celebrating, again, the Ascension should tell us something much different, that we are part of the body of Christ. And you know, he ascends to heaven, but remains with us in this body. And we are filled with his spirit. But there's this a radical communion, not only with him, but with one another. And when we enter into the faith life fully, or a husband enters into the faith life fully, he strengthens the, his body, his domestic church, if you will, uh, in drawing them all closer to to God. In the same way, a monk who is really at the heart of the church, he doesn't see himself as separating him from uh, this greater reality, the context in which he embraces that solitude, which is really entering into the heart of reality. It's really entering into the heart of our relationship with Christ. And in this sense, he knows the, perhaps the deepest intimacy with all other men and women of faith, but also is able to perceive the presence of God in all that he's created. And it's not simply a kind of isolation or uh, escape from the world. And the same would be true of those who live the cloistered life. You know, the, those that they encounter on a day-to-day -day basis may are going to be very few, a half a dozen, maybe less even. And yet they are called to love them completely 
and in loving them completely and in giving themselves over to God completely, they are also strengthening the body as a whole. And if we understand the Eucharist uh, correctly, then I think we should understand this that there is a, a radical bond of love that keeps us connected to, to each other. And so they have to see their contemplation. They have to see their asceticism in, in light of what God has done for us in Christ. They are part of the body of Christ and they do this not for themselves or for selfish reasons. They have a follow, but it's also not simply a focus on self and becoming perfect, right? That's right, it's not just focusing on self. And I think becoming perfect, I think they would see themselves as journeying like we are. And I think the sense of perfection as we often have as human beings is very quickly lost because what they compare themselves to is not their past life or not with comparing themselves to others and how they're living their life. But now the standard for them becomes uh, more and more clearly Christ. And so what becomes uh, clear to them is their own radical poverty and their need for God's grace. And so this is why repentance, as we've talked about so often in the past, is what they often will begin with. And why, what we hear within the gospel as well, both from John the Baptist and Christ, this is where, <clears throat> excuse me, they both begin to preach, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. We are to live in a constant state of turning toward God because God alone is our hope. And it's only by his grace that we are sustained, but it's also only by his grace that we are able to engage in the spiritual battle and to be gradually freed from the grip of our passions and to give ourselves over more and more fully to the life of prayer and grow in virtue. But we are never able and often God prevents us from seeing the progress that we have in the spiritual life in order that we are not drawn back to look at ourselves, to admire ourselves or our own particular virtue. What he allows us to see more often is that poverty, not to punish us, but in order to be able to allow us to be raised up by his grace. You know, he who humbles himself will be exalted. So the acknowledgement of our poverty is what allows us to be lifted up by his grace and to be freed from the grip of our passions. It's not simply, you know, they, I think they are often described wrongly as athletes in, in the sense of how we view athletes in the world. That if we just strive hard enough or if we go for it, or if we endure all the pain that we possibly can, you know, no, no, no pain, no gain kind of mentality that, you know, we will succeed. And the, this is, would be a distortion of the Christian life. I think we know, you know, part of our moving forward is acknowledging our incapacity to do that outside of the grace of God, that it's only by his mercy that we are freed. And the more that we acknowledge that, the greater freedom we begin to experience in our life. We do exercise. As I said, Christianity is an ascetical religion, so we are to take hold of the grace that God gives us. We are not to, to hold it cheap or uh, through laziness or neglect, but we are to embrace it fully. But always at the forefront of our mind, is that it comes to us by the mercy of God. And so even the latter image is problematic, you know, in the sense uh, that it can give us this view of, you know, climbing up and we're moving from one step to the next and we can lose sight that it's actually God who is lifting us up by his grace. We show this willingness on our part through our, the life of prayer and our desire for him. But we don't want to get this sense that simply, you know, by endurance or hard work, we are going to get there. There have been heresies that have been named uh, for that in the past, you know, where there's an overemphasis 
uh, upon the human effort to, to the neglect of the grace of God. Okay. So the last line, let us run the race imitating not Lot's wife. So looking back, but as Locke did, looking forward uh, to the freedom that God was leading him to. Uh, that line from Proverbs says, a dog returns to its vomit, a sinner returns to his sin. You know, a dog has this gross habit of going back and sniffing, you know, that which he has regurgitated. And, uh, you know, our tie to our sin, our attachment to our sin, our self-will can lead us to do the same thing, to experience this pull to turn back and look at that or desire that which we have cast off uh, or sort of like the Israelites, you know, why couldn't you have le left us in Egypt? At least there we had onions and I can't remember what all the other fruits they talked about at that point, but at least they, even though they were slaves, they had regular food. Whereas going out into the desert, you know, they really uh, at times struggle with food and had to rely upon God with a radical kind of faith and the mediation of Moses, you know, and this sort of points us to Christ who provides, you know, through his intercession then, they are provided with manna, manna from heaven, bread from heaven, and, and, and then eventually meat as well. And all of this points us, you know, to the, to the Holy Eucharist, you know, Christ is the, the new Moses if you will, but still, you know, we struggle with that same desire, enter into the spiritual life, and all of a sudden, the world hates you, the demons attack you, you experience your poverty all the more, all the more in your life, things do not go smoothly for you, and it can make us want to say, you know, gee, before I was a Christian, or before I became a priest, my life, you know, was a whole lot easier, and I've, you know, since I became a Christian, I've experienced nothing but trial or hatred or vindictiveness and malice, and not from anyone outside of the church, but only from people within the church. That's when you really feel uh, discouraged and want to go back to, to Egypt. And so keeping our focus here upon Christ, not looking back, is essential because we're all going to experience those moments. So that brings us to the end of step two. Does anyone have any follow-up comments or questions? All right. On to exile or pilgrimage. Exile means that we leave forever everything in our own country that prevents us from reaching the goal of piety. So an interesting way, way to start it. So leaving everything in our own country and, you know, certainly we could look at that in a literal fashion, you know, that we would leave our home, our own country, familiar surroundings. Uh, but leaving our own country, everything in our own country, I think, is leaving that which is familiar, you know, and most of, of all the things that are familiar within our own hearts, you know, the, or the world that we have sort of carved out for ourselves that it provides a sense of security, safety, comfort. And that can even be, a, you know, a Christian identity can even be a part of that, that we could shape a, a spirituality and identity where we are embracing the gospel, uh, but sometimes the more pleasant parts of the gospel. I think I remember Fulton Sheen saying that at one point, you know, that that's what we gravitate to, the positive parts, but we sort of avoid reading the, the think parts of the gospel that are really challenging. And so avoiding any really big sins, you know, trying to be a bit basically a good pe person, helping other people out, you know, but those are all good things, but one could achieve them by natural virtue and, uh, or by temperament, but we are called to something far different. We are called to be Christ-like and our life, our love is to be self-emptying, cruciform. And so to leave our own country, leave everything in our own country, can also mean letting go of what feels comfortable to us and allowing ourselves to be challenged in a radical way, to step out into the unknown, very much like the rich young man 
you know, but even on a spiritual level again for us, but the rich young man, when he has Christ standing before him and he's living a good and virtuous life, he's kept the commandments. And so Christ sees him, he loves him and he wants to give him everything. And he, so he tells him, go sell all that you have and then come follow me. And he can't get himself to do that. He has the Lord of life. He has the fullness of love standing before him. And he was not able to do what Peter and Andrew, James and John did or what Matthew, the tax collector did. And so in some sense, it was even his good life, you know, that made it even more difficult for him. He, it provided him a certain level of comfort that he was living a life that was pleasing to God, that he was righteous. He was in a right relationship with God. Whereas John tells us here, leave everything behind that prevents us from reaching the goal of piety. You know, that which is ordered toward God or leads toward God in the way that God desires. And so often we will shape our own piety rather than allowing it to be shaped by the gospel or what God speaks to us through our conscience or, or what experience or life itself hands us. You know, we would always choose a different cross than the one that's been handed to us or that we bear in our day-to-day -day life. Most everybody's seems lighter than, than our own, or we would think that there would be one that would be, we would be better suited to carry. So exile means modest manners, wisdom which remains unknown, prudence not recognized as such by most, a hidden life, an invisible intention, unseen meditation, desire for humiliation, longing for hardship, constant determination to love God, abundance of love, renunciation of vainglory, depth of silence. So it's kind of interesting. One wouldn't expect this definition of exile. There are a lot of things within this list that really have to do with the interior life, modest manners, you know, that we aren't putting ourselves uh, forward or that we treat others with a kind of gentleness and tenderness. We aren't harsh towards others uh, or unyielding. Wisdom which remains unknown. So the, we aren't seeking to elevate ourselves uh, as knowing more than what we do, or even when we do have wisdom, that we aren't putting ourselves forward as being the, the source of that, but acknowledging that it is from God. And so the way that we speak about things, the way that we speak about the spiritual life, or the way that we engage people about the spiritual life, especially when uh, there is a kind of hostility towards it. Uh, is an important thing, you know, because our, a, a wisdom that remains unknown is not going uh, to seek to control, manipulate, or bend some, someone in accord with our own will, or to try to force them to see things in the way that we see them, especially when it comes to matters of faith. The faith is a gift from God, and so you know, we can argue with people because we're well-read in the faith or we're well-read in the spiritual life and, and feel that we can argue them uh, to come to see what we see. And so we can be very aggressive in the process. And, uh, and so this exile is meaning that we, we let go of that. You know, that we're, we, there are, we are not responsible for saving everyone. In fact, there's only one Savior, and it's not any of us. And what we have to seek to do is to open ourselves to that uh, salvation that he's given to us, and that we speak to others of the beauty of it, of what it has given to us, and we, most important, we live it. And this is where the wisdom that is unknown, you know, that what people see 
is Christ, uh, the wisdom of God, not us. You know, it's, you know, it's, preachers are always in danger of this. You know, it's not as though your personality cannot be a part of proclaiming the gospel, you know, because we're human beings and it should throw, flow through that reality. But we are not to become uh, spectacles. And so often those who are in the position or have been given the responsibility of preaching can become exactly that. That the personality, the, the manner of preaching becomes in itself a distraction from the gospel itself. And uh, this can be a very subtle thing or can be a really clear thing, I think, in the way that uh, preaching is often done. And, uh, and so there has to be great care there. And so both for, you know, in our day-to-day -day life, but certainly for those who are charged with pro proclaiming the gospel, not to put oneself forward. Prudence not recognized but as such by most. Uh, you know, the, the prudence of one who's following Christ radically is probably going to seem like foolishness not prudence, it's going to seem ridiculous and dangerous in some ways too. You know, that we have in the world, I think, grown to have this sense that we need to, you know, get all kinds of fire insurance for ourselves to protect ourselves, you know, that we have to make sure that our, our future is going to be covered and so don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that people shouldn't have pensions and things like that, but I think we, are, we can be driven by this kind of anxiety. Well, we don't know if we're going to live past tomorrow or tonight. And so, you know, the, the way that a person enters into their life in Christ and their relationship with him is going to perhaps be judged as imprudence by some foolhardy. And often the word prudence is uh, put, up, put forward as an excuse for a lack of courage in our day. So you want to be prudent in your spiritual practices, or you want to be prudent, you know, in terms of how much you go, go to mass or you engage in your devotions. You're getting too extreme in doing that. These are, are things that I often hear. And I think what that's rooted in is a kind of fear or lack of courage of, you know, to enter into that relationship fully. What will my life become if I do follow Christ in this radical way? And, you know, there is a little voice within us that can say, hold back. And it can be so subtle that we get to a point that we don't recognize it because it's the most familiar of voices. You got to protect yourself here. So, a hidden life. Uh, St. Philip Neri, you know, one of his counsels was to love to be unknown. And I remember hearing that for the first time and being struck by it. And, you know, novices would be given, you know, there's a long, long novitiate, three year long, you would not be studying you know, that they would be focused more on the life of prayer in order that this virtue that they're being, that is being spoken of here. And if you remember, Philip Neri read Climacus, to love to be unknown is to become comfortable with this exile from the things of this world, of not being respected by the world and of not pursuing the religious life or the priesthood because you want to be known. You want to be recognized by others. Because if you're living the gospel, you know, the kind of recognition that you're going to get is probably not going to be good. You know, we should always be a little bit wary if we're being praised by everybody. And uh, because we don't see that in the gospel too much. In fact, just the opposite. And it's a danger in our day. I mean, even with something like this, you know, podcast, you know, I'm happy. I, I love the fact that people are listening to it and finding it fruitful. But you, in our day, you know, religion, like anything else, 
you know, can be something that is sold or put forward and in a sense where one has to make it attractive, appeal to the senses. And this can subtly distort, in some ways gravely distort, the message of the gospel. And so we have to be very careful because we have all these things that make it available, make it possible for us to reach out to more people than ever now. And we could be tempted to become performers or to produce content in order to attract people's attention. And we, and if you remember in our beginning of the study of the fathers, Father Ster, Fer, Seraphim Rose said, we don't want to become dilettantes. You know, we don't want to fall into this trap of reading the fathers in order that we can tell people about the fathers and what they've written so that we become, you know, known as experts in the desert fathers. There, I don't think there is such, such a thing. Uh, and so this love of being unknown is meant to protect the heart and to make sure that, again, Christ stays at the center of our, our life, but also of others. An invisible intention. You know, again, in our day, everybody's telling others what they're doing and why. And some of the saints refer to this as kind of like opening the furnace door over and over again. And when you do that, you let out the heat and you lose that desire for God. Uh, but it also, as we've talked about many times before, makes us vulnerable, you know, not simply to the criticism of others or the scrutiny of others, but it makes us vulnerable to the, the attacks of the demons. They cannot read our minds, but they can see our actions, the things that we do, the habits in our life, and they can use that knowledge to manipulate us. And so if we're constantly talking about our intentions, and if we are broadcasting our intentions on Facebook, during Lent, I'm going to do this, then we can pretty much be guaranteed that the evil one's going to attack those things right from the get beginning to pull us away from them. And so our intentions, especially about the spiritual life, our spiritual role and discipline should be talked about within the confessional, spiritual director, close confidence, or, count, or those that we seek counsel from, and not broadcast in a public way. So it's one thing to talk about the spiritual life as a whole, and it's another thing really to talk about what's going on within our own hearts any more than one would talk about one's intimate relationship with one's wife, you know, in a public forum. Unseen med meditation. So our practice of prayer, you know, go into your room in private and there pray to your father and your father who sees what is done in private will reward you. And so not to be standing on the street corners or making, again, a spectacle of ourselves. Desire for humiliation. That we know that the, the path that is set before us is the path of the cross, the way of the cross. And so humiliation, you know, within this world should not be seen as something that is dishonor to us, but something that configures us to Christ. And so not to be feared. Now, you know, it doesn't mean that we, you know, purposely bring scorn upon ourselves by doing harmful or ridiculous things. but you know, that we willingly embrace those humiliations and even in a sense, desire them because we know that they conform us to Christ. That, and this is a hard thing. And I don't want to say this in a cavalier fashion because the saints only came to know this through experience, that Christ was not absent in those humiliations. What they began to experience is the greater presence of Christ you know, the more that they find, find themselves being crucified by the world, they found themselves united to the crucified one. And also experiencing the power of an action of his grace in their life in unexpected and hidden ways, but ways that were most needed for them and for their salvation. And so often in retrospect, it can be the deep, deeply humiliating things in our life, the things that feel like enormous losses that produce the greatest virtues within us or perfect virtues within us 
of patience, of long suffering, of desire for God, of desire for, for the kingdom. Longing for hardship, similarly. Constant determination to love God. So <clears throat> having a, and developing a, an habitual mindset of this turning to God and fostering this longing and desire for him. And, you know, we've mentioned the meaning of desire as being a sense of lack and completeness. And so every day we thank God with gratitude for what we received from him that has allowed us to live this day. And we thank him for his blessings, but we also ask for what is needed uh, in order to be able to, to live that life. And by this, you know, we, we foster this constant determination to love. And the more that we pray, the more that we practice the virtues, all of these things build upon themselves and build that, that determination to love God more and more fully. Abundance of love, renunciation of vainglory. So running from certain experiences that we may, may see a kind of danger hidden within them. That if I take this path, it might bring me a certain amount of praise, of acknowledgement, but what, what will that do to me spiritually? Will I get tied up into it so much that it becomes the focal point of my life, that it becomes what gives me meaning? And so, you know, in our society, the climbing up the ladder, you know, whether it's in the spiritual life or uh, in teaching, preaching, or in terms of our career, you know, we have to be very careful there, you know, as we make strides forward, are we doing this in order to glorify God, trying to work as hard as we can in whatever uh, field we might be involved in, or whatever life we are living, in order to use the grace that God has given us, or are we pursuing this to elevate ourselves? And so, renunciation of vainglory, and then depth of silence. That, you know, so many of the saints, St. Isaac the Syrians, that tells us, you know, that silence is the language of the kingdom of heaven. And we get this from John of the Cross as well, you know, that we begin to walk in a kind of darkness, you know, and because our intellect, our reason, our imagination is silenced because it's, it cannot draw us into that deeper intimacy with God. It has limitations, but so do our words. And uh, if you remember, I've often quoted a Carthusian that says that silence allows God to speak a word that is equal to himself. And so a one who lives this exile is going to want to move away from noise and the agitation of the world in order to have this greater and greater silence not to, again, to avoid the world and the things of this world or others, but in order to draw close to God and to listen to what he speaks to the depth, in the depths of our hearts. And if we're constantly surrounded by noise, and even if our prayer is so filled with our own thoughts, ideas, images, then we might not hear what God is trying to communicate to us on the deepest, in the deepest parts of our hearts. Ashley. Oh, did I miss a few here? I did. I'm sorry. Ashley, I'll, I'll get to you in one second. Sam, regarding this, something I've found helpful is to try to be grounded in this. If it's good, God gets the credit. I can only take credit for my mistakes. Absolutely. And Anthony, maybe some of the self-will and desire to propose oneself as great in an area is a symptom of demonic attack on a person's worth, a subtle and constant message, you are worthless. Yes, and I think we see this a lot in a very public way, too, in our culture, uh, the kind of sadness that, uh, in those that have even reached the pinnacle, uh, you know, in, in their own particular field that they see that the, the wealth, the fame does not bring meaning. In fact, it can bring a profound emptiness. 
but it is often this subtle temptation. I think that's right on, on the mark that you are worthless, that you have no value. Whereas for the man and woman of faith, we, we, we should see we have a, absolute value. God has given us what is most precious and beautiful. He's given us his only begotten son. Ashley from Arizona. If this isn't very coherent, I'm sorry. Oh, I thought you were going to say I've been drinking. This reminds me of something in the Imitation of Christ by Thomas A. Kempis, that when we suffer, we should remember that we are on probation and that we shouldn't rely on our, on, our, on a place or, or place our hope in the world, nor seek to justify ourselves to the world who won't always understand. I think that Catholics who are on fire for the Lord, who, who are firmly in their vocations, run up against the temptation to not be misunderstood by the world, to not offend when teaching the truth. It's as if the temptation of vainglory today tries to be popular and holy, which is antithetical to the spiritual life. Anyway, the rest of the quote goes, it is good for us sometimes to suffer contradiction, to be misjudged by men, even though we mean do well and mean well these things help us to be humble and shield us from vainglory when all, all outward appearances men give us no credit when they do not think well of us then we are more inclined to seek god who sees our hearts therefore a man ought not to root himself so firmly in god that he will not need the consolations of men a man ought to root himself so firmly in god yes absolutely and you're right. I think, you know, this is, again, kind of the danger in our world, too, especially when the faith is popularized. And, you know, I think we need to speak to our own age. Each age needs its own religious or spiritual genius, if you will, of how we engage the world the day uh, of our day. But there is this danger, uh, I think, of trying to make it uh, attractive. And, uh, and that can be driven by vainglory. We want to be accepted. We want to fit in. And uh, part of that's our, part of our culture, too. Catholics coming to this country often dealt with a lot. And they really had to hide a lot about themselves, changing their names, you know, in order to get work you know, often very difficult. And, you know, I think this is carried on by this sense of wanting to be able to integrate ourselves fully into the culture, to enter into every part of life. And on some level, we are called to do that in order that, the, the, that you know, our faith might permeate every aspect of the culture. But if it's not done in a discerning way, and if it does not begin with Christ, and if it's not rooted in him, then I think what Ashley puts forward is, is what takes place here, that we become driven more by vainglory. We want to be accepted, and so we shrink back the moment that we begin to be criticized or we, we face contradiction. And so on some level, we have to expect it. And I think the Lord allows us to experience exactly what Ashley put forward here. These times where we are mi misunderstood, when we mean well or we do well, and people see it in, in a certain light and criticize us for it. They attribute to us, you know, all of these, you know, intentions which aren't there. And I, I think the Lord allows that to happen in order that we don't cling to you know how others view us uh, you know i mentioned in the ever Catinos, you know my love for the story of samuel choosing the the one who's to be anointed the new king of israel and goes to the jesse's house to see his sons it's one of his sons and he sees eliab and he has that bearing about him very kingly and Samuel thinks to himself, surely this is the Lord's anointed. And God tells Samuel, no, he's not the one. I've rejected him. Uh, for, you know, God does not see as man sees. Man sees the appearance, the outward appearance. God looks into the heart. 
And we don't want to lose sight of that, you know, where we step back into that of wanting to be seen, you know, by others in a certain light and in a positive light. And we become overconscious of it. What we want to be conscious of is that God sees what's within our hearts and that we bear witness to the faith, whether or not it's rejected or embraced. Any other comment? Great, great comment. It wasn't uh, confusing at all. So excellent. Ambrose Little, there is a flip side to that too. And I think we have to be careful both ways. We can enjoy being countercultural, right? And want to, in a sense, stick it to the world to show just how different we are, right? That would be the negative uh, part of it. In that way, we are risking a kind of pride uh, that we are better uh, and want to show it off by being combative unnecessarily, right? And I think why seeing what John describes as a whole, how he defines exile is important here, especially, you know, these modest manners here, because you're right. I think there can be, how did you describe it in a comment on a, a post? I think it, they used the word tribalism. Is that right? And Catholics can fall into that, you know, where we see ourselves as a part of a group and, you know, all the, all others are against us. And so we, we can take up, as you said, this combative attitude. And so I think seeing uh, these last comments in light of everything else that he put forward, you know, the hidden life, wanting to wisdom, which is unknown, modest manners, is to keep us from this kind of harshness. Because I think what you described there would be a kind of vainglory in its own right. You know, to see oneself as hated by the world can make one feel really good about oneself. Well, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the right here. And the fact that everybody hates me proves that. Well, perhaps we're just irritating obnoxious people <laughs> and not really bearing witness to the gospel. So good point. Man, excellent comments and questions tonight across the board. So that brings us, we're over time, and I'm sorry about that. I got caught up in the comments, but all excellent, again, as always, per beautiful questions and comments. And uh, exile will be a very interesting one for us to, to go through, and very fruitful as well. But we've gotten off to a good start with the first paragraph we're running. So well done. Okay. So when we close there, as always, with our, our prayer. That Christ taught us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.